by the end of 1993, Sonic's popularity had risen to unprecedented levels. Not only were his games massive selling chart-topping hits, but his huge appeal had spread even further beyond the gaming world with an endless supply of merchandise, comic book series both in the US and the UK, and two wildly different animated TV shows airing at the same time. Sega was even in talk with McDonald's to create Sonic-themed Happy Meal toys to help with promotion for the next game. Speaking of which, development for said game began only a couple of months after the release of Sonic 2. In that time, Mark Cerny had left Sega to pursue other interests, being replaced by former Atari designer Roger Hector. Production on Sonic 2 had more than a few momentary setbacks due to the language barrier and cultural differences between the Japanese and American developers. As such, Hector decided to split them off into two separate teams. Whilst the American team began production on a spin-off title for the Blue Bomber, the Japanese team, led by Yuji Naka, would set to work on the next mainline title in the series. And there were big plans on where to take the Hedgehog next. But certain circumstances would force the team to make drastic changes to their overall product. At least for now. Sonic the Hedgehog 3 was released for the Sega Mega Drive on February 2nd, 1994. Sega of America decided to take advantage of the fact that their new game was being released on Groundhog Day, effectively renaming it Hedgehog Day, and even travelling down to Punxsutawney, Pennsylvania to promote it, bringing with them the giant Sonic balloon that was used during the previous year's Macy's Day Parade. I'm willing to bet this wasn't the shadow Punxsutawney Phil was expecting to see that day. Perhaps even more bizarre than that, Sega Europe decided the best way to promote the game in the UK was to get pop group Right Said Fred to rework the lyrics to their single Wonder Man and shoot a music video that heavily promoted the game. God, the 90s were weird. While both regions' box art have interesting designs to them, I have to say that I do think that the US got the better deal. It just has a more appealing look to it, the bright popping colours, Sonic standing centre stage looking cool, Tails flying behind him more eager and excited, and Robotnik furiously torching the rainforest in the background. This image is a perfect precursor for what to expect in the early stages of the game. When you look at the European box art, something doesn't seem quite right. Sonic's hands are spread out awkwardly and look disproportionate to the rest of him, and the background is a rather flat illustration of one of the game's levels. It's still a fine enough cover, but it just doesn't have the same appeal as the US version. At the very least, we do get a glimpse of the new character joining the series, a new enemy for Sonic to battle against, Knuckles the Echidna. When Sonic 3 was being conceptualised, the development team wanted to create a new rival for Sonic, one that could stand up to him in a way that Robotnik couldn't. His design was created by the team's animator, Takashi Yuda, and as the name suggests, is meant to resemble an Echidna. The character comes off as something of an antithesis to Sonic, with the focus being on his strength and power, as opposed to the Hedgehog's speed. He was originally going to be called Dreads, due to his dreadlock-like spines, but instead they named him after his trademark spiked knuckles on his gloves. Good thing too, because Sonic and Dreads doesn't have as nice a ring to it. Well, can't start a Sonic game without this sound. Never get tired of that. From the very start, you'll notice how different Sonic 3 is from its predecessors, as a 3D rendering of Sonic crashes into the Sega logo before taking his spot in the title screen, waving and winking at the player. Not only that, but for the first time in a Sonic game, a save feature and multiple save slots was added. Not massively revolutionary, but a huge selling point for the game. Features like these show you just how big a deal this game was going to be. Set just after the events of Sonic 2, Dr. Robotnik's space station, the Death Egg, crashes onto the mysterious Angel Island, where he discovers that the island uses the power of something called the Master Emerald to float in the sky. The Doctor tricks its guardian Knuckles into thinking that Sonic is going to steal the Master Emerald, but Robotnik himself secretly plans on using the Emerald to repower his Death Egg. Once again, it's up to Sonic and Tails to stop the first Doctor's plans once and for all. Like last time, you can choose to play as either Sonic or Tails alone, or together as a team. The core gameplay remains much the same as it did before, only this time the additions and changes are a little more robust. Both characters control much the same as last time, only now Sonic can create an insta-shield in mid-air, allowing him a brief second of invincibility against enemies and projectiles. As for Tails, players can finally utilise his ability to fly, an incredibly useful trait that can help him access new areas of each zone. If controlled by a second player, he can even lift Sonic up to areas that he normally couldn't reach alone. He can also swim underwater as well. The only downside is that he is vulnerable to attacks while in this state. This does make Tails more of a unique character, and he can be a bit more useful in the main game. 
that is if Sonic chooses to stick around and let him. The zones have been greatly expanded upon. Each zone is again split into two acts, and are now reportedly three times the size of those found in previous games, opening up more opportunities for exploration. This also means that the levels are much longer and cannot be completed as quickly as the others, but very rarely does that make them a chore to get through. Finishing a zone's first act immediately transitions into the second, giving the illusion of both acts being connected to one another, which probably explains why the zones are apparently larger. The environments are more detailed and vibrant, and each zone provides its own set of challenges and forms of traversal, some that even alter a zone's terrain. There are new and tougher enemies for the player to face, which is why our heroes can make use of three new shield items found throughout each zone. A flame shield that prevents fire damage and lets Sonic use a fireball dash attack, a lightning shield that attracts rings to the player and lets Sonic perform a double jump, and a water shield that allows the player to breathe underwater and lets Sonic do a bounce jump. Robotnik continues to appear for a boss fight at the end of each second act, but now the player also has to face a sub-boss after every first act as well. The battles aren't too difficult to handle if you know what you're doing, and while a handful of them can be a bit tedious, the sheer variety of challenge more than makes up for it. My personal favourite is the Marble Garden Zone, a mid-air fight where Tails is holding onto Sonic while Robotnik attacks them with a big drill. Sonic 3 also features numerous cutscenes throughout the game. Not only do they provide additional bits of story to the hero's journey, like Knuckles destroying a bridge that sends the player down into the Hydrosity Zone, or Sonic being shot out of a cannon in one zone and then snowboarding down a mountain in the next. It can also serve to change up a zone's surroundings, like when Robotnik's machine sets Angel Island Zone on fire, turning it into a blazing inferno. After making their way through tropical rainforests, frozen tundras, tranquil ruins, watery passageways, and... Hell? Our heroes arrive at the launch base zone and hurry to prevent the relaunch of the Death Egg, culminating in a three-part boss fight with Robotnik, leaving it a chance to ride the Eggmobile for a bit. After defeating Robotnik, the Death Egg blows up and... that's it. The game's over. It kind of feels a little anticlimactic, and not even going all the Chaos Emeralds can improve it. Speaking of which, the method in which you collect them has changed yet again. Whereas in Sonic 2, the star posts would take you to the special stage, in Sonic 3, you'll instead be taken to a bonus stage where the player can bounce around a large gumball machine and pick up more rings, extra lives, and different shields. The special stages can now be found inside these giant rings that are hidden throughout each zone. This time, you'll run around a spherical map trying to run through all the blue spheres whilst avoiding the red ones. This is easily the most fun version of the special stages yet, but at the same time, it can be the most frustrating. The checkered layout combined with a constant turning and consistent speed increase can mess up your head and leave you feeling a bit disorientated. Even if you've memorized the layout of the maze, a few wrong turns at high speed can result in you losing your focus and send you crashing out of the stage. Collect all seven emeralds and you'll once again have the ability to turn into Super Sonic. Thankfully his power has been toned down a bit this time. He's not as unwieldy as he was before, and can now be activated by performing the Insta Shield attack. Sadly though, Tails still doesn't get his own transformation. What's up with that? The music for Sonic 3 is probably the best of the Mega Drive era. While Masato Nakamura didn't return to help compose the soundtrack, this was the first Sonic game where we got to experience the musical talents of musician and video game composer Jun Senoue, who would become a long-time collaborator for the franchise as part of the band Crush 40. There was also a long-standing rumour, which was eventually confirmed, that none other than pop sensation Michael Jackson was also involved in the creation of Sonic 3's soundtrack. Being a huge fan of Sonic and already having worked with Sega to produce a series of games based on his film Moonwalker, Michael and his team worked for weeks to produce a series of tracks for the Hedgehog's latest escapades. However, he was reportedly unhappy with how the console replicated his music, and that, combined with other allegations at the time, caused him to leave the project and his work remained uncredited. Despite this, Sonic 3's soundtrack does still contain that unmistakable signature Michael Jackson sound. Some tracks can even be compared to some of Michael's other work, like how Carnival Night Zone sounds similar at points to his song Jam. And the end credits theme bears more than a passing resemblance to his later hit, Stranger in Moscow. This has resulted in a few legal issues regarding its soundtrack, and as of the recording of this video, the game hasn't seen a modern re-release since 2009. There is a lot to love about Sonic the Hedgehog 3. Of the original trilogy of games, it easily stands out as the best among them. It's the most impressive graphically, it's the best in terms of controls, the levels are expansive and offer a great deal of content that, for the most part, doesn't feel like it's constricting the player's progress, 
the music is undeniably good, and all around is another great improvement over what's come before it. Even the two-player mode is better than last time, having been streamlined to be a simple straightforward race with its own unique levels and music, going so far as to include Knuckles as a playable character as well. However, there is still that major downside to this game in that it feels a little short. The abrupt ending that you get after beating the final level leaves you with the impression that the game wasn't really finished. And that's because technically, it wasn't. Come back next time for the final installment of Sonic June and a look at an incredibly unique concept that would completely change the Sonic games we knew.